Good evening, everybody. Good evening, wonderful people. I'm glad y'all are here. Give yourself a great hand. We're glad that y'all are in the house. Yes, I know we said six o'clock, but I wanted y'all to, to tour the tables in the back. And did y'all meet somebody y'all didn't know? Anybody? Or y'all just came with the same people? Y'all got to, I want you to turn around to somebody that you don't know and say, hi, neighbor. I'm here to make a difference. Come on, y'all. It's Black History Month. All right. In the old days, you used to meet. The goal of this meeting is for you to meet some people you don't know. Because we don't have neighborhoods, we got strangerhoods. So the more that we connect to each other, the better we're going to be. Because Nino Brown and Don Corleone, they know how to connect. And so good neighbors like you all, we got to know how to connect to each other because the time is out for saying that we don't know each other. I don't know how that happened. The goal is that we need to know, make sure we know everybody. So thank you for coming. I'm glad you are here. And welcome to Bob Mathis Elementary School in the wonderful school. Give it up for Bob Mathis. I want to call up the wonderful principal, Ms. Dawn Blackwell, and then she's going to give us a few words and we're going to hear from the leaders of now. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to Bob Mathis Elementary School, where I serve as the proud principal. Just a little bit about Bob Mathis. In the last two years, Bob Mathis has come off the list, and we continue to show improvement every year. In the last year, Bob Mathis has gone from a two-star school to a four-star school, six points away from a five-star school. The biggest asset for Bob Mathis would be our students. At Bob Mathis, we believe that we must show our kids something different, something new, something to believe in, something that they don't necessarily see on a daily basis. We are preparing for our Georgia milestone, and at Bob Mathis, we prepare slightly differently. We do sometimes do pep rallies, but we also like to make life relevant for our students. So our newest initiative is to get all of our students, third, fourth, and fifth grade, out to see the movie Black Panther so that they understand possibilities. The concessions that are out in the lobby, all proceeds will go to our goal. Our goal, we have to raise $2,200 so that all third, fourth, and fifth grade students can see the movie cost free. We will have Nyla Washington, one of our fifth grade students, to come with the pledge, followed by essays from three of our students regarding why they believe they should go see Black Panther. <laughs> May everyone please stand for the national anthem, for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to a republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Avery Smith. I think the movie Black Panther is awesome because it has black superheroes. Kids have someone to look up to that looks like them besides Su Superman or Batman. Black Panther gives kids who look like me the opportunity to see ourselves on the big screen as black superheroes. This movie taught me that African Americans can achieve anything we want in life with hard work. For example, the movie director and all the actors were black. The cast showed that we can be strong, 
proud, mighty leaders who can defend our country like they did for Wakanda. These are the reasons why it would be fantastic if all black Bob Mathis students could have the opportunity to see the movie. Hello, my name is Janae Brown. I think it would be a good opportunity for my school to go see Black Panther because this movie gives me hope. When I heard about the film, I wasn't very excited at first because I thought that it was going to be just like all the other movies where African Americans aren't really the main characters, but this movie is different. Kids can learn that there are no limits. For example, when the Black Pan Panther got hit with the spear, he didn't stop fighting, he kept on fighting. This shows perseverance. It teaches, it teaches me as a kid that even if something is hard, keep on trying, never give up. When I saw Hidden Figures, I felt like I finally had someone to look up to as a girl. Now with this film, both, boys, both girls and boys can have positive role models too. This movie shows African Americans that even though the people of Wakanda face hard times, they still worked hard to achieve their dreams, and so can I. Hello, I am Nala Washington. When I heard about Black Panther, I was excited, ready, and interested. Kids can learn that Africa and its culture is beautiful. It can teach me that African Americans are beautiful in every way. I felt like anything I believe I can do, I can do for real. I felt when I saw hidden figure, figures, I can be whatever I want. It shows me that black people on the African continent are very powerful and they are in a beautiful country. Once again, if I can get one more round of applause for Mr. Xavier Smith, Janae Brown, and Nyla Washington. Bob Mathis Elementary, fifth grade students. One additional announcement, because we have so many community members here, we do have our Dr. Seuss Day on Friday and we are looking for readers. So if you would like to read, stop by, get a red sheet, fill it out, and we will put you on the schedule. Thank you. Come on, y'all, give it up and help them go see. help them go see the Black Panther movie. I think it's important for them to see it and, uh, and come back and tell, talk to us more about it. I want to thank you again for coming. Now we're going to go uh, to our uh, panel discussion, and I want the panelists to come up, but I'm going to save uh, our public safety director, Jack Lumpton, for last, and we don't go in any particular order, but I want our DA, Sherry Boston, to please come on up, and then she's going to say a few words and then take her seat. Donna Stribling Coleman will come on up. I want her to say a few words and then take her seat. Judge Crawford from Juvenile Court will come on up, say a few words, take your seat. Pamela Stroudenbrand, changing the circle. It's very important that mental health be a part of what we do. We cannot do this in a vacuum. We hear about mental health and what's going on. I want them to be here. And they got a great program I want you to be part of. And this is... Uh, I don't know how they got Bradley Cooper down here. That's not public safety director. The Cab County, County Schools. Okay, where is he? Please come on up. He's our public safety director for the Cab County Schools, so we're holistic in our approach. And also, I guess our chief of public safety, Jack Lumpton, you can come up on up as well. Let's give our panelists a great hand. So what we're going to do is hear two or three minutes from them, and then our keynote will be Chief Public Safety Director Jack Lumpkin, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A from you all. We also have a form that we want to make sure that you get if you're part of the community on an issue that you are having, and make sure you write down the issue, be very specific in what agency you want it to go to, and what we're going to do is get that to agency, because a lot of folks may not want to talk, or we may not get to all the questions, but I want you to get that question answered. So what we want to do is get that piece of paper from you. Has everybody got the sheet of paper? It was at the front, it was at the front desk. 
Michelle may have to pass them out. But please get that sheet of paper because some people may have specific issues they may not want to share publicly, but want to make sure we get it to the right agency that can help you at the time. So, Madam DA, please take it away, and then we'll go down the line of people that I called in that order. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Sherry Boston, and it is my honor and pleasure to serve you every day as your DeKalb County District Attorney. Um, I have been your District Attorney for the past year. Prior to that, uh, I served you for six years as your DeKalb County Solicitor General. Um, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Johnson for his continued leadership and bringing together everyone in the house tonight um, for us to address your concerns about public safety in our community. Um, I am going to reserve time to really address any questions you might have, but ultimately I just want everyone to understand what the district attorney's office does. We prosecute all the felony cases that happen within DeKalb County, and we also prosecute all the misdemeanor and felony cases in juvenile court uh, for those children that are charged in the juvenile system. Um, I, I ran uh, on a platform and I am running an office on a platform where uh, we are going to be, be progressive and smart on our prosecution, which means that we will focus in holding our violent offenders accountable in our community, while at the same time making sure we have restorative and rehabilitative actions for our young people and our nonviolent offenders. We need to make sure that we can get our folks in the criminal justice system out of the criminal justice system where that's possible. Um, so my focus has been to make sure that if, uh, if you are committing our most violent crimes, that we are making sure that you are no longer going to be a threat to that community, which means we are going to prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. But understand that there are diversion programs, accountability courts, and nonviolent offenders that we need to treat differently in our system so that they can get back into the real world and make sure that they can be a productive member of the society that they're coming back to, which is our county right here in DeKalb. So uh, I'm happy to answer questions later, but again, thank you once again. I am Sherry Boston, and it is my honor and pleasure to serve you every day as your DeKalb County District Attorney. Good, e Good evening. Is that better? There we go. Good evening. My, my name is Donna Coleman Stribling, and I am your Solicitor General. I have now been in office for uh, just over a year, and I'm excited not only to be here to speak to you today, but it always feels to, good to be a place I call home. I grew up on Boring Road and lived here for about 20 years, so this is a familiar area for me. Um, my job as the Solicitor General is to prosecute the misdemeanors that happen in this county, and that means those are the cases that are DUIs, your theft cases, the minor theft cases, your domestic violence cases, but we also handle uh, ordinance cases. And typically, a number of those cases are the, what we consider to be the quality of life crimes. That means that code enforcement is addressing a concern in the community. So uh, while we understand that misdemeanors affect our everyday lives, in fact, about 13,000 cases is what we prosecute every year. Um, and we also have traffic courts. So, of course, if you're dealing with a speeding case or anything like that, we handle those cases as well. We know that most individuals will likely come, if they have a charge, they'll come through the misdemeanor system. And we treat those in a way where we recognize there may have been a mistake, this is a situation that perhaps we can simply deal with, move on, and keep you from getting a conviction. Um, we have a number of diversion programs. One of them is Goals, one that we are very proud of, and we try to instill life skills into some of our young adults. So what we do in my office is, of course, address the misdemeanors, um, prosecute those that we know we need to move forward with through the system, but the ones that we know we can rehabilitate, we can deal with you in a different way, get you back out there, because a lot of us, 
it. And a lot of individuals are going through the system and simply made a mistake. And if we can address it in a different way, that's what our goal is to do. I consider this job one that it actually is a prevention. I'm in a role of prevention because every day my goal is to, and hope and prayer is to keep young individuals from ever going to any other type of court. So we to try to grab them then, give them life skills, and give them the opportunity to get back out there and get started with their life again. I will be here. I'll be happy to speak to any of you afterwards. Um, and also, please feel free to take any of the brochures from the table that we have set up in the back. Once again, my name is Donna Coleman-Stribling, and I am your Solicitor General. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Vincent Crawford. I'm, a, I'm one of the four judges in DeKalb County Juvenile Court. We, um, we're a different kind of court, and one of the things we do is I try, or we try to prevent our youth from going to the solicitor's office or to the DeKalb County DA's office. I had the pleasure of serving here in DeKalb County as a DA, um, then going on to private practice then serving in magistrate court before I went on to become a juvenile court judge. We are a court that, that pretty much um, do two things. Number one, on the dependency side, that's where children are brought into foster care. Our goal is to reunite children back with their parents. Um, we have uh, dependency actions pretty much going on every day. Um, we work with the Department of Family and Children Services as well as any community-based services to help families, um, to reunite families. Um, at the current time, we use, uh, DFACs attempt to use a lot of community-based resources so that parents can be aware that there are resources out there to assist them as they attempt to raise their children. The other side is the delinquent side. And on the delinquency side, um, Thank you to the governor for the new statute in 2014. We're now more, juvenile court is more of a community-based court, which means we are by statute are to come out into the community, try to find resources for our kids. We work with kids in three areas, home, school, and the community. In the home, we have pretty much what we now are calling our CHINS program, which deals with status offenses, certain things like ungovernable, that's for us from the old school, kids that talk back, um, and any kind of issues of runaway, we handle those issues through chins. Uh, we then have our um, regular courts, we have a drug court for our young men, we have a mental health court for our young ladies, and I run the CAPS division, which is our commitment alternative program which is our high-risk offenders, and that program is designed in, to keep young men from actually coming into the prison system. We are constantly and always looking for community-based resources. Please visit the table in the back. We have brochures back there on what we do. The days of locking kids up are over. They've been over for the last four years. We don't do that, um, and we have seen that um, providing resources to families um, is a better way of doing it than locking kids up. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pamela Shelterbrand. I am the president of Changing the Cycle Foundation, Incorporated, and we're based in Laitonia. And our goal is to bring mental health awareness to all of DeKalb County. Right now we have family support groups and mental, for mental health and peer-to-peer -peer support groups that we have to bring awareness to mental health because so many of our families experience mental health and that is playing a huge problem within our kids as well. Mental health start as young as three years old. And that's something that a lot of us have to realize and stop being in denial. And through our foundation, that's what we are bringing awareness to. We're knocking on school doors. We're knocking on churches. So we invite you all to either come and take a part, visit a National Alliance of Mental Illness, which is an organization that we partnership to bring more mental awareness 
to the South DeKalb area. And if you would like to know more information, I'll be happy to talk to you at the end. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bradley Gober, and I am the Director of Public Safety for the DeKalb County School System. Um, I want to start with giving you a little information about my department, the Department of Public Safety. We actually have 73 police officers that are post-certified police officers that are in our schools. We have a police officer in every high school and every middle school in DeKalb County. We have a security division that consists of 114 campus supervisors. They are security professionals that work closely with the kids in the administration, and they keep an eye on the campus. They patrol the campuses, the parking lots at all times. We have a crossing guard unit of 120 crossing guards. These are the people that help the elementary school age kids and children come uh, from and to school in the mornings when they walk and in the crosswalks. We also have a safe schools unit that consists of four safe school professionals, and they are the ones that go around to the schools and do what we call surprise audits. You hear a lot about active shooter drills and intruder drill, intruder alert drills. We've been doing that in DeKalb for a while now, and that safe schools unit that's in the Department of Public Safety, that is their responsibility. They literally just show up at a school and put the school on a level three lockdown and they grade the students, they grade the staff, and they grade the SRO, the security personnel, on how they respond. They don't know it's coming and then they get input from the students and the staff. They ask the students how safe did they feel, were they prepared for that drill when they come in. And they use that to grade the school in their performance and if it's not a passing grade, then what they do is they work with the administration to bring up those deficiencies to where they are passing. Um, that's just a little bit of what we do. Our police department consists of those 73 officers that I was saying earlier. We have two canines, an explosive canine and a narcotics dog. We have a gang unit that consists of two full-time gang detectives. We have a criminal investigation division that investigates crimes on schools' properties, uh, from financial crimes to uh, stolen cars. Um, I will be here to answer any questions you have while we're on the panel, and I'll stay afterwards if you have any questions for me. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Now I want to introduce, can you hear me? All right. I want to introduce our Jack H. Lumpkin, Senior. He became the Chief Operating Officer, our Public Safety Director, on January 29, 2018. He is responsible strategically for enhancing the day-to-day -day service delivery of the Cab County Public Safety Department. I'm going to skip down to the bottom because he wants to take seven minutes and then we're going to answer questions. Jack Lumpton serves as the Board of Director of the International Association of Chiefs or Police, a 30,000 member organization. Prior to joining the DeKalb County team, he served as Chief of Police for the Savannah Chatham Metropolitan Georgia Police Department. He, he was employed to restore trust and legitimacy to the citizens of Savannah and the culture he's about changing and making a difference. He's a proponent of community-oriented policing, police-solving, co-production mode. His governance and managerial philosophy is grounded in Dr. J.W. Fanning's pillars of leadership and intelligence-led precision policing and the police operation approach to crime reduction. But before I do that, I want us to thank, we got various directors and different departments of human development, our marshal's office, our fire department, and all those resources back there, I want us to take advantage of it because what I did want to happen was, I didn't want to make public safety just a police issue. This is an issue that involves all of our agencies, our community and all of that. So let's give them a great hand so they stay part. And our sheriff's department as well. And I saw Dima back there for our natural disasters and tornadoes are getting ready to come up. But I want to say thank you to all of them for all you're doing, your service. We love you and we care much about you and what you're doing. 
we were gonna give him a raise tomorrow. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> y'all y'all gonna clap for that. <laughs> but let's without further ado, I'll bring up our new public safety director, Jack uh, I'll go to doctor, but Jack Lumpkin, everybody. Good evening. Thank you, Commissioner, for inviting me. Thank you, Commissioner, for inviting me to the town hall meeting. Can you hear me in the back there? Uh, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, I'll have what, less than 30 days on the job. Uh, and I'm trying to listen, learn, and lead. Uh, listen to you all, learn from you all, and then actually decide what we need to do different. I believe in what something is called stop, start, and continue. Stop, stop doing those things that don't make sense, that we always, we just do because we always did it like this. Start doing things that we need to do that we are of value and continue to do things that you as citizens and guests think are valuable. The, my job, as the commissioner said, is to, to uh, strategically enhance the day-to-day -day operations of the public safety departments. And the public safety departments are police, fire rescue, uh, it starts with 911 uh, because that's the way you get the police and the fire rescue, et cetera. But you also have animal service, you have uh, the medical examiner, and you have the emergency management uh, department uh, for the county. The, those departments are critical. Why do we f focus on the th three large ones, 911, fire rescue, police? Because those numbers are within the uh, hundreds. There are hundreds of police allocated positions. There are hundreds of fire allocated positions. There are hundreds, a hundred plus uh, 911 operators. We have to improve the culture in our those three big uh, departments. We have to improve technology in those departments. We have to improve the leadership in those departments, uh, the, particularly at the focal leadership level. And that's where I call the sergeant's level or whoever the line operation person reports to. We have to, re uh, the CEO, Mr. Thurman, his directive is to improve police services first by recruiting and hiring 248 police officers. Now, we can do that. We can do that. Not Jack Lumpkin can do that. But we as a community can do that. To do that, we've got to make the Cab County the place that people want to police. It's got to be a great place to work at. This has to be competitive in terms of salary and benefit. But mainly, we've, it's got to be a great place to work at. That individual must believe that his or her supervisor actually wants to establish a motivating environment that the person can have satisfaction, can perform well, grow and develop for the future. The individuals at the line level are the future uh, chiefs and public safety directors. We have to treat them like that. They're leaders. We have to teach what I think uh, I've been teaching in, since 2007 or so in different police departments, uh, leadership in public safety organizations. We have to use behavioral sciences to establish those. That you don't have to remember the principal's name. Uh, of the behavioral science, but you have to understand the principle and you have to treat people right and help them grow. But for if we don't do the employee like that, they don't give you the service that you need. And I knew as a young supervisor many decades ago that if I caused that individual problems in the squad briefing, 
he was going to cause a citizen a problem when he got on the street. If we can make our people satisfied, happy, and they have the right heart, we must recruit for character first, character first, and won't tolerate anything else. And then we can teach them the competencies. In my last place of employment, uh, Metro Police in Savannah Chatham, they had not been to full staff in, in approximately 20 years. We got there and they were 100 officers short. We, got, we have a little deeper hole than that. But we got them there uh, within 16 months. They said, well, two, hiring 248 officers is not that difficult. But you, most people don't account for we're going to have attrition during that period of time. We're typically, you're going to lose 10% of your force each year. You have to retain and lower that attrition if you want to ever have real quality. Communication, our public safety uh, answering point, 911 com communication. It typically lose 20 to 25% of its staff annually. We have to lower that. Think about running your business or working and you are losing uh, four, one out of uh, four or one out of five employees every year. What are you doing? You're just training. You never get quality. We've got to change that. Fire service, we have to do some things in fire service to ensure that we continue to get quality applicants and we're staffed at a means and a mode that fire service people can actually take days off and they don't, they aren't forced to work because we can't afford for them to be off. On the community side, uh, we have to reduce crime while we are down lower it with these numbers. Just because we don't have the allocated staff is no excuse not to continue and try harder in terms of reducing crime. I agree with the district attorney that we need to focus on those most violent, those people that are harmful, those people that are shooters. The uh, studies show approximately 0.5% of the population are the shooters. If you focus on those, you will have a disproportionate impact on all crime. You will not all crime down because those people get up every day going to work with a gun in their hand. And that's what they call it, work. At the same time, you must, as the juvenile court uh, advocates and judges would tell you, you must focus on youth. You have to have youth development. If you do not have youth development, you will have more crime. If you do not have youth uh, development, you won't have neighborhood development. You won't have community development. You will not have uh, the, for the long term, workforce development. And if you don't have workforce development, you cannot have economic development. If you don't have a trained workforce, you're not going to have economic development. So the safety of our, our community, and not just a particular portion of the cab, but the safety of every neighborhood is paramount. And we have to police those block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. The other thing that CEO said it was that we need, he wanted to see significant coordination, communication, and synergy developed between uh, the emergency, between all the departments, particularly emergency management. You know, I think last year or so was the first time Metro had ever been on a hurricane or, or watch type in the history of this state. The climate's changed a little degree. Unfortunately, the last place I came from in three years, they had two hurricanes and uh, 
a uh, tropical storm with an ice snowstorm in Savannah. So the, the, the weather is not what it, we have to prepare, but we have to plan. One of the things that you all can do for us today is not to overuse 911. Don't call 911 when it's not an, not an emergency. It, when it, you do, you prohibit that other call from getting through, which may be a cardiac. It may not be a police issue, but it may be a heart attack. It may be, uh, be a stroke. It may be a fire. We have only X amount of staff, every 911 center. There. But our center receives more calls than the other metro centers receive, which are not 911 emergency calls. And that's a cultural issue that we can change. We must focus on crime while we try to get officers back on the street in terms of the numbers. We must have your help in recruiting officers. We must have officers that are diverse, male and female. We must train, they must have character coming to the job, and we must train them in the competencies that they need to actually police. That's my philosophy. I hope it will match well with our community over time. I know it drove the crime rate down in Albany after year after it led uh, the nation in per capita murder in the 90s. We dropped it 40, 50 percent in Athens over time, uh, the homicides and the violent crime. We, we were significantly uh, with citizen support, with citizen support, last year we reduced homicide in Savannah over 30 percent. And the clearance rate, uh, Madam District Attorney, was in the 80 percentile because citizens were actually talking with the police and respected the police. They went walking up on the door and knocking on and said, hey, he did that. But they were communicating with the police in a manner that we could protect them and we could get the information that we needed. I appreciate the invitation and I'll try to answer your questions as they occur. Before I get to you over there, I'll get this one question. All right, Glenwood is one of the most dangerous areas on this side of the county. What is the possibility of getting a small mini precinct in the area of Glenwood? Well, we did have a, I'll answer that start off. We have a, we did get a mini precinct about six or seven years ago, and it was a partnership we wanted to do with the community. I had the owner of Ansberg, uh, it's right there at the corner of Glenwood and Austin, right in that, um, where that club is. Yeah, vibe, club vibe. And so we, we got the space. I had the space lined up. We cut the ribbon. And part of it was he provided the space. We got the furniture. But we, we had to have the community be part of that as well. And so we did not get the participation that we needed in terms of having a true public partnership. Now, if we can open it back up, I can go back and ask him. But we've got to have folks who got to be over there because the police can't be in the building because they need to be out here trying to get rid of some of this crime. Another question is, given all the wonderful resources and committed professionals to help prevent and address the violence, please share with us your opinion on why the violence and crime here increased in DeKalb and other metropolitan areas. Thank you. Anybody want to address that on why crime increased in DeKalb and other metropolitan areas? Crime has increased in some municipalities, some counties, and, and re, it has actually had significant reductions in others. It's the way the citizens and the police interact. And it, it stop frisk is almost down to nothing now. It's called intelligence-led precision policing. And I think that's what the uh, district attorney was speaking of, uh, if you go after the right people, 
with a laser focus, you can reduce crime. So we get this question a lot, and, and I can't <clears throat> speak for the police department, but I can say that we have seen a rise uh, in homicides in DeKalb County. Uh, there's been many stories and articles about the fact that our crime rate has surpassed the city of Atlanta, or I'm sorry, our homicide rate, let me be specific, has surpassed the city of Atlanta, and that is in fact true. Um, we have seen an uptick in murders and homicides in major cities across the country. So this is an issue that those of us that are working in metropolitan areas are dealing with. I can tell you that we have an initiative um, and we actually have a press conference coming up with uh, our public safety director and our chief of police, Chief Conroy, uh, on Wednesday about the new initiative that we have developed and the new unit that's going to be coming out of the district attorney's office um, to address this very issue. Um, so I say that to say is a little bit of a tease about what we're doing, but what I want you to know is that we recognize that this is an issue. Um, I traveled all across the country and spoke with DAs in St. Louis and San Francisco and uh, DA Vance in Manhattan, Kim Fox in Chicago, and we've all discussed this issue um, and I'm just happy that we are going to be bringing some of those strategies and ideas to DeKalb County, uh, the first of its kind in Georgia, and I look forward to talking more about that after Wednesday. But the, the, when, you, uh, when you come out and see our press conference, if you come or you see it on TV or read in the paper, you will understand the new approach uh, that we are going to take to try to address um, the violent criminality that we have in our community and specifically in, in some of, uh, in this area, in the area that I live in, in the area uh, that's Commissioner Johnson's. Um, so we are committed to finding new strategies to help in these areas. Um, let me say um, on behalf of the youth in DeKalb County, uh, because we get this often, that we have a large population of let's just say it, bad kids. Um, that's not true, okay? And when I went to speak over at one of the high schools, I told them, I said, do not let less than 1% give the whole high school a reputation that it's a bad school. So let's not let a few kids that are engaging in activity give all of our kids in DeKalb County a, a reputation that we have a county full of bad kids. We've implemented several programs in juvenile court and we've seen our numbers decline and that, as I indicated before, it's upfront services. So we had, to, we had to make a decision. They're the children that we're mad at and they're the children that we're scared of. There's a distinction. There's a kid that we're mad at because they just did something, like any parent, with a kid just like, you know, you made a mistake, um, you should have used better judgment, but there are some kids that we're seeing that are not, have never come across the juvenile system that go straight from, um, to SB 440s, which are the adult offenses. So I don't want you to think that some of, a lot of those kids are coming through the system. I run the CAPS program, which is our commitment alternative program, and we've only seen two kids actually go on to commit an adult offense in our five years of existence. Um, and that is to prevent them from actually being committed to DJJ or committing adult offense. So don't, do not let anyone give our schools or our children in our community that all of our kids are engaged in criminal conduct because that's not true. You have a small percentage that are actually engaging in criminal activity. And a part of that I tell people all the time no kid comes into the world a bad kid, okay? That does, you have to know the story behind the behavior, and part of that is getting into that house, getting some therapy, because a lot of our kids are going through not only trauma in the home, but what I call environmental trauma, okay? All right, thank you. Question at the mic, please. Yes. Mm. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I welcome our elected officials and thank you for being here. 
Uh, my name is Chief Ernest Marshall, and I'm here to represent the hotel motel industry, and I was the one that had that long card. Uh, the first thing is the budget. Everybody speaks of money when you talk about profit. Uh, they just take the hotel motel with $5 per room per person extra. Uh, the state is receiving $200 million from uh, taxation on the motel hotel industry. And what we brought up to the cab convention and bureau, that 2% of that 5% of that $5 needs to go to public safety. And uh, we feel like our public safety officers should receive that 2% out of that $5 because a payment and that are first responders. And in the industry I'm in, there's a lot of different things happening and a lot of changes that happened in the last 10 years. Uh, we also need to make sure that our officers, some of them may need, uh, not just officers, but individuals that work for the government need sensitivity training and make sure that we can handle some things. Because I talked to somebody from the Convention and Business Bureau and they told me that my statement meant any, nothing, but I've been in the business 16 years, and I'm also an uh, expert in Title VI, 1964 Civil Rights Act. I've met with the county in reference to the Civil Rights Act, and I don't think we have anybody that's really dealing with that when it comes to contracts and other things. Uh, the third thing is that homelessness. We need to take and deal with this issue that we have. Uh, uh, okay, I'll wrap it up. Okay, homelessness. We need to have some grant written, and we need to have the court system to deal with homelessness individuals that we have uh, that's put in the streets. We have a 15-year-old kid on Wesley Chapel now that's been floating for about a week, and uh, his parents haven't been looking for him because we mostly are the first respondents when it comes to people missing. Uh, and i wrap it up. And the last thing is uh, this ordinance that they just passed. Uh, we had no input in it, uh, totally, uh, and it was passed in reference to the expediency of it being passed. Uh, I understand that I do have First Amendment rights, 15th, First, Fifth, Fourteenth Amendment rights, and the right to participate. And I was chosen by some of the hotel motel people to participate with this ordinance, but we had no input because I had surgery. Okay, my question to Commissioner Johnson. How do we take and deal with the ordinances that are passed that might not have an input from the local business people and we are the highest taxpayer? And number two, how can we get 2% of that 5% that's $200 million that can go to our police service? Thank you. All right, the ordinance he's talking about is that we just passed an ordinance for extended stay hotels. We have, it just passed in uh, November, December, one of the strictest ordinance in the state of Georgia where you now cannot live, we, we've, what I did, I put in there in the preamble that extended stay hotel is not a permanent place for housing. It's a temporary place. It never was meant to be a permanent place for kids and families to live. And so then we made it so that you can't stay no more than six months in that place. We also put it in place that you have to have a modern sprinkle system put into that place. I've also put into the ordinance uh, whenever you go get your business license, if you have a certain amount of violations, we're going to make sure that that license is held until you correct those violations. Uh, that was done because we have a lot of folks, anybody in this community, you can attest to this. I get a lot of calls that people are just tired of what they see emanating out of these establishments. Now, you know like I know, and the young man next to you, we had a meeting and I brought together all of the Wesley Chapel Extended Stay Hotel owners. We sat in the meeting and we talked about the perception that you have has to change. Your marketing strategy. <laughs> and, I, and, and I'm not down them because people do have tough times and hard times, so they're gonna have to have a temporary place to live. A disaster, something happens. But what we talked about is getting additional security, and we talked, we were all in a circle, and they were supposed to come up with a plan to make sure that we have it. What Wesley Club did, which was basically what was, we put in place is they now have closed off between Popeyes and Shell gas station. It used to be you can just drive in and out. What that has done is it's cut off a major drug corridor 
that was leading to a lot of crime in that area. But what it did was made the extended stay home hotel folks upset, but what it did for the folks in that area, it calmed down on some of the issues. We also went over to talk to the Shell gas station man. You got to put a sign up, and I took pictures today, and I gave him the major KD because I was over there. You still got folks just hanging around, loitering like they want to sell dope and drugs. So, and I'm not just telling you something from the desk. I walk it, I drive it, I talk to you. So what we have to do is you have to make sure we come up with something because when we had that hurricane, um, it that happened in September. Folks were coming from Florida and all these different places. And when they Googled online and they looked at the hotels, and this is one of the things that the hotel owners came, that's why we had this big meeting, they bypassed a lot of the hotels on Wesley Chapel because of the bad reviews. So that didn't come from me, that, was, that came from talking to the hotel owners around security. So that's what we have to do. So we did get input, the Cab Convention and Business Bureau did talk to the hotel owners. Uh, they tried to water, we had folks coming from Johns Creek, Alpharetta, tried to water down the bill here in the cabs. And so we said we can't tolerate it anymore. But what we did say we want to work together because if you raise your prices, you make sure you get those rooms more modernized, you cut down, you, you work with our human development department to get those families into permanent housing. Those are things that we can put in place to create a continuum of care to get the prevention and intervention in there. And then we work with our police, our DA, our solicitor to make it happen. That was the compromise we came up with, but we can't do, we can't do normal anymore because it's not getting us anywhere. And that's what the reason why we had that, that conversation. So they did have input from the hotel and motel people. They didn't like it. When you don't like something, guess what? You get mad at the commissioners. So I'm willing to work with you all on what we can do to make sure that the perception of your place, that people move forward and do those things. So we can talk after the meeting to have further dialogue. I'm, I'm willing to come over there again and sit in the circle so we can talk. But you got to get a security force over there to help cut down on some of the issues because the police cannot do it by themselves. And folks do not want to get accosted going to Popeyes or Shells, all of those things. We got to make it safe for people to walk in that community. So those are some of the things that we did that we have to work on. Next, next question. From our thank chess, you, chess man. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I'm in a Cab County resident for 18 years. I've trained over 55,000 kids. I teach them brains before bullets. My method is heads up, pants up, grades up, and the big one never give up. I'm doing a free workshop for the Cab County residents say coming free, up March Say 7th. it again, say free. A free workshop coming up on uh, March 17th. What's that date? March 17th. It's a Saturday. What's the day? What kind of day is it? Saturday. And I'm teaching young people. I, let me tell you a little bit about my background. I was in the Air Force. I took the Air Force exam, and they said, wait a minute. If nobody can score this good on a test, can you redo it? We think you cheated. And I retook the test, and I scored higher. I, and they said, how would you do that? I said, I know the pattern. They said, what do you mean? I said, I play chess. I teach people how to play chess. What I'm saying, though, I'm a resource. I'm in the Cal County. Disney hired me to promote chess across the country. And they said, well, let's go in the school that you connected with in the cab. I said, I'm not in any school in the cab. They go, what? We'll just fly you to Hollywood. So I'm here in the cab county, and I'm letting people know I'm a re I, need, I want to partner with you guys because I can teach our young people how to be givers, not takers. There's a song out by the average white man called The Love of Your Own. And in this song, it says this, and this is the key. This will stop the jail rate. This will stop the crime. In this song, it says, the sooner you give, the sooner you get to have. The sooner you give, the sooner you get to have. <laughs> and that's all I'm doing. I'm a force for good. I'm a force for what? Good. And I'm teaching young people, get your head up, get your pants up, get your grades up. One last statement. When we come together as one, we can achieve the extraordinary. That's right. We need volunteers to step up so we can mentor our young people and put them on the right path. So thank you for what you're doing with the chess. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Just wanted to ask so we can make sure that we're at ease with the people that are here. There's a lot of 
things that have happened in our nation from Columbine down to Florida as far as school shootings. Yes. Active shooter program. What are we doing to make sure that we're safe here in DeKalb County? Well, DeKalb County um, is actually, we've been working on a lot of different security protocols before the Parkland tragedy. Um, I'll just go over a couple right now. Um, one of the things that we've done is those 73 SROs that I spoke of earlier, at least, I'm going to say 95% of those, because we've hired some more SROs within the last six months to a year, are all active shooter trained in a program called ALERT. All right, that's advanced law enforcement response training. Okay, and that's and what that is, is it teaches law enforcement officers how to respond to an active shooter situation. And that program is a very good program. And I don't want to speak for DeKalb County, but I, I know that most of the municipalities in DeKalb County, DeKalb County Police, the Marshal's Office, the Sheriff's Office, also have officers that are trained in this program. Because like we saw in Columbine and Parkland, the SROs are not going to be the only people when we have a tragedy such as that happen in the school. And so what happens is it helps that all the other law enforcement officers around have the same training and on the same page to respond in the same way, in the same manner. Now also, the DeKalb County Schools Police Department has an emergency response team. We have an ERT team that is not only trained and alert, but all of them are actually alert instructors, and they have also been to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center to where they became federally certified in active shooter scenarios, and at that point, they became instructors in active shooter scenarios. Now, what we started doing, and we looked at this, Dr. Green and the board have an initiative, a security initiative coming out that is gonna put a pilot program for metal detectors in our schools. And that should be rolling out very soon. We're gonna shoot a uh, pilot program, and it's gonna be strategically placed in high schools around the district to see how that goes. And that's in the works now. Um, we also have uh, an initiative for more security cameras, and we're going to get more SROs in there. So I think it starts with training. Now, I will say um, a lot of people know about the MLK incident that happened a couple of weeks ago where we had an intruder in the building with a gun. One of the, one of the things that really, and I see the, the, the theme of all this is the community working together, and in the school system, it's our faculty and staff and our students. And one of the things that kept that from becoming a tragedy was our students were alert, they were aware, and they took responsibility for their own surroundings. And it was actually a female student that noticed and observed that this man did not belong in her school. And when she did, she actually followed him and made sure, and she's the one that saw the weapon and came and reported it to the school resource officer. And within literally two minutes of her reporting that to him, he was already apprehended. Mm. And so I think that we, when we talk about our young people, and the judge had talked about it earlier, they don't get enough credit for what they do. You know, we have a lot of good children in our school system, and they're taking responsibility, and they're working with the school resource officers, security, and the staff to take responsibility for their own safety. Yes, sir. You know, my dad had a saying that nothing in his house belonged to me. Now, this is what I need parents to do. You, your child's book bag don't belong to your child. That's your book bag. And so what happens on the back end is I get the kid now expelled because they had a weapon in their book bag. And I'm looking at the parent as to why didn't you check their book bag? Because some of this could start at home, okay? So I suggest that you go through your child's book bag, purse, or whatever. If they have any privacy issues, you tell them you paid for it. And when they get their job and can pay for their book bag or purse, then they have a right to say no one can go into it. But that really, because what is happening now, if I, I have a group of kids, the law in Georgia is this. If a kid brings a, a gun to school, they are permanently expelled from DeKalb schools 
and they will be permanently expelled, and no other county is going to accept them. I, I now have a 15-year-old that is not able to get an education, can't even get online mm. to go to school. That is the law in Georgia. So I think for a lot of our kids, it's usually in DeKalb County, what we've seen is people on the outside coming in with guns, and the kids that bring guns to school is kids snitching. Snitching is telling the truth. There's a gun here. That's the truth. And getting kids to understand that it's okay because there's a weapon in the school and you may not be injured, but somebody else could be injured. But again, it starts with that book bag. Open it up and say, let me see what you're taking to school. It should be books, pens, and paper. All right, thank you. Mr. Williams? Good afternoon. My name is Ed Williams. I've been living in South Dakota for over 20 years. And the reason I'm here tonight is to show and demonstrate the uh, concern I have about the crime in our neighborhood. I actually met with uh, Director Lompton uh, last week. And I, I, I assume most of you all are here because you all are concerned about crime too in the neighborhood. We are, and myself, I speak for myself, is past frustrated about the crime in our neighborhood. In fact, I want to make sure that we are not asking you all to solve the, uh, reduce the crime. We demand that you all do reduce the crime. Because in a real sense, you all work for us. This attitude that we've had for the last 10, 20 years that you, we, you all are somehow over us, uh, 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 supreme over us, it's, it's wrong attitude. You all work for us. We should be here demanding that the crime is reduced. Now, what I would like for you all to give us is an idea of how long it's going to take for the crime to start going down as far as murders, rapes, and robberies. Because the Cayab County at one time used to be one of the safest communities in the whole state of Georgia. So what happened in this foot? So let me make this short because I see a lot of other people want to ask questions. But we need a timetable and we need a plan as to how you all going to reduce the crime. It is no longer acceptable for us to have to endure this amount of crime in our neighborhood. No longer. Thank you. We're going to work diligently to reduce the crime. As I said, the first step is to get officers on the street when you are 20 to 25 percent less than what's authorized. What I would ask the community to help us hire police officers. We will put best practices in that will reduce crime. As the district attorney spoke of the practice that you will hear, best practice that you will hear from shortly. To give a specific time that we're going to reduce crime by uh, X percentage in a period, having been here 20 odd days, that's not practical for me at this point. All right, next speaker. Next speaker. Okay. okay, question, comment, question. Directly. Uh, in DeKalb County, they have this take home uh, program you know, for police officers. One thing I had thought about, you know, like when, before they auction those old cars off, perhaps you could let every policeman that want to take one of those cars home, but just take all the electronic equipment out of it, because I was told like some of those cars are not, you know, mechanical fit to do high speed chases in, just let them drive them from their homes back to the precinct, then get the car that they can do chases in. That's, that's one of my comments. Okay, uh, the juvenile judge, elaborate on what you said about the day is over for us locking you stuff. All right, so what happened about four years ago? Um, we came up with this thing called the DAI score. And what a DAI score is basically when a kid gets um, arrested, we do an assessment. Okay. And we uh, do a risk assessment to see if this kid is a risk to the community. Okay. Based on that score, this kid is released. Now, this is what you have to understand. All science studies have shown if you mix a low-risk kid with a high-risk kid, the low-risk kid will become a high-risk kid. Okay. All right? That's just 
factual. So what we had to do is we are not mandated, I'm not mandated as a judge to always follow the score on release because some kids, they may have not as many offenses and so it's discretionary. But the kids are released. Now what we've done is what we, one of the things that we, we have a problem and the police officers can testify to this is that we have a lot of parents that want the police department to manage their children. And so the police shows up and they want them arrested. Now what they really want is a break from their child. <laughs> but that's not a basis for locking the child up is because you want a break. Now that's your child you raised. So a part of that is the parent and that's why we have programs in like CHINS. But we've reduced the rate of kids being locked up in DeKalb County. Okay. And you have kids sitting over there with, you know, cursing out their parents, uh, low level issues that need to be resolved in the home. But we've now just taken a police officer off the street for three hours to deal with a parent and a child versus they could be out, you know, solving a crime or, or something else. But we know the governor, for example, my grant, the CAPS grant, that's $750,000 that the governor has given us to keep high-risk kids from um, committing a new offense or going to prison, and it's working. Okay. We've gotten high remarks um, for doing it and, and doing, doing very well with that. So the issue is, is, is not locking kids up because it doesn't work. All you do is let a kid back out and they come back to the same issues. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker, Mr. Piegler. Good evening. My name is Charles Piegler. <clears throat> Sitting here listening, one thing I'm not hearing, those guys back there that risked their lives, nobody's talking about money. We're all talking about let's drop the crime rate. DeKalb County has one of the best academy in the nation. You can keep them if you pay them. Let's understand that. Now, uh, uh, I haven't met you yet, sir, but uh, one thing, uh, I like what you said, but you, did, you didn't give us any specific on lowering that crime rate. Uh, this kind of form is nice, but everybody here is looking for an answer to crime. What I don't see around this table is code enforcement. What I don't see is sanitation. All of that is economic growth. You can't reduce the crime if you don't reduce the trash. So all of these, I, I, you know, I like all these philosophical ideas, but if you don't pay them, they're going out the door. I'm a, a, a business owner, and the only way I can keep employees, I have to pay them what they're worth. And they are worth more than we are paying. Now, the Cab County can find money for everything but pay public safety. All right. One, one, one follow-up. Uh, solicitor, can you talk about your code enforcement effort? Because it's a... Tell about the, the, pro, the, the magistrate court, what you all are doing. Well, in the last year, the, um, the Board of Commissioners and the CEO's office have, has taken a strong look at blight in DeKalb County. And you've heard the CEO, the Board of Commissioners talk about all the issues that we've had. You've seen a number of areas in DeKalb County that have been addressed and a number of Trust me, we recognize that there are a large number of them that need to be addressed. Code enforcement is not a part of my office. A lot of people tend to think, okay, you're the solicitor. What we do is we prosecute the cases when code enforcement brings them to us. But I will tell you, within the last year, one of the first things that I did was determine, first of all, we need to, just like we designate people to deal with cases on domestic violence, we designate people to deal with de cases dealing with DUIs and other issues, traffic citations. I specifically put together a unit that deals with blight. They handle the code enforcement matters. That was one of the first things that I did. I asked for the money. You gave us the money to do so mid-year. Since then, 
we've had two trainings with code enforcement. One of the, the next thing I realized is that we're not on the same page. We were not on the same page. What is it that we really look at? Are our biggest issues the hotel motel or are the, are the biggest issues residential? What should we target first? It was never our idea to address a elderly person whose steps are not code up to code and then ticket them and ticket them and ticket them because what happens then? They, the reason why they're there is because they simply can't pay for it. That's not our focus. Our focus is on the repeat offenders, the people who have the money to fix the issues and to address those first. So in the last eight months since we've received that money, that has been our primary target. We've been working with code enforcement. We're, we're, we're on the same page about what we're doing and we're moving forward with those cases that we know you guys care about the most. Uh -huh. I, it, it, it's funny because when I got into office, I think the first email I, I received, it was about a code enforcement matter. And then, uh, then the next, the phone call I got was code enforcement. I was there for 2.2 seconds. And I quickly realized that DeKalb County wanted to get back to an area that we felt was clean and one that we could be proud of. Amen. And so that's our target and, and we're still moving forward with those things. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Betty Hargret. My name is Betty Hargret. Lindro Ralph. Marion Ralph. And Francis Stanfield. We live in the Hampton Hills subdivision and we have a unique problem. Uh, we have a house in our neighborhood that was sold uh, about a year ago. The house was a four bedroom house. It has been converted to a nine bedroom house. Mm -hmm. And uh, we suspect, actually we really, we know that the owner is running a boarding house out of that house. We just have not been able to prove it. Um, we have talked to him initially. He wouldn't talk to us. Finally, we decided that we were gonna hire an attorney. Our attorney sent him a letter and expressed our concern that this, you're operating this house in this neighborhood that is zoned single family residential, which is a violation of the ordinance, and the neighbors would like to speak with you. He called our attorney after he got the letter and was very belligerent. Uh, why would they get an attorney instead of talking to me? Well, we tried to talk to you. Uh, that didn't work. And he told our attorney that uh, he converted the house to a nine bedroom house because his relatives were displaced from the storm in Houston. Well, he's owned this house for over a year. The storms in Houston didn't come up until September. So we know that that's not true. Um, we have also, every night, there are at least eight to 12 cars parked in the driveway and on the street. Uh, it has caused crime in our neighborhood to skyrocket. We just recently had, we've had several break-ins. Uh, four cars were broken into just last week. Uh, all of our neighbors have now decided that they're going to get these um, ring cameras so that we can um, monitor what's going on. Code enforcement has already been notified they can't do anything because the owner won't let them in the house to inspect. We need your help in telling us what we need to do to get this house out of our neighborhood and get this crime down. Okay. I'm going to uh, I'm point you to two people that are standing in the back. You see the, the young, yes. I'm going to call it young lady. I'm going to say it again, young lady, Claire Farley. She is my community prosecutor. Um, when there is an issue, with the neighborhood, and, and trust me, I get the emails, I get the phone calls, I forward them to Claire, and all of a sudden, seven o'clock at night, she's sitting at somebody's home discussing what we can do about it. So I'm asking you all to please follow up with her today. Come on. So that we can follow up with that and see what we can do to and investigate that matter. She will get it done. Next speaker, please. Yeah, that's just gonna have to go way down. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Ashley. And I'm Alex. Uh, we're neighbors. Um, in South DeKalb, we absolutely adore our neighborhood. It's just awesome. It's diverse. Our neighbors are kind and wonderful. Um, with the exception of one house that sits vacant um, during the week and anywhere from two to five nights a week is being used as a club. It has 50 cars parked in the yard and all over our neighborhood. Um, there have been gunshots at least four times in the last six months. 
Um, and obviously we call the police, but um, they kind of have their like exit strategy down pat, and by the time the police get there, everybody's gone. Um, and so we've called code enforcement, but haven't heard anything back from them. And at this point, we're just wondering who, who do we need to talk to, because it's out of control. Um, the last shooting was two nights ago. I have an 18-month-old son, and he's we're two doors down. Um, and it's just getting scary. And last summer, this has been going on for a year, um, and last summer it was five nights a week, and we're starting to get nervous about the weather getting warm again. So just wondering who we need to talk to. Well, and, and I'm going to point you to the same person, and let me tell you why. One of the things about my office is that we deal with code enforcement, but that's not the only way an ordinance violation can come in. I tell people we may not get them the way you want us to get them, but let's start somewhere, right? So if we can go to sanitation, if we can go to water, however it is that we can start tackling this problem, because I can guarantee you, you're telling me that there's, there's gunshots, and I, and I understand that, of course, when the police get there, everybody's scattered. Um, but the, the, the ordinance violations are in so many different arenas and so many different departments Mm -hmm. it, you just never know which way to go. So some of the best ways is for us to figure out how to tackle that issue. Um, and that's what we've been working with. And that's when I tell you oh, we weren't on the same page. No, this is getting us on the same page. Because I may not be able to, to shut them down through, you know, having somebody arrested. But, you know, if, if, if the issue is a power issue and they violated code with power, or they violated code with, or with a business license issue, let's start there. You know, eventually you can make people mad enough to just want to leave, <laughs> right? That'd be nice. So we will do what we can do, okay? Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I have a follow-up though. Sure. As a more immediate response to uh -huh. that, so at this point it's like, great, it's Monday, so we hit the reset button, but come Friday evening, we have a full expectation that there will There's be 40 be to 50 cars parked in a front yard mm -hmm. that we can expect women who are entertaining, that we can expect alcohol to be sold, drugs to be sold, and gambling to be taking place two doors down from homes mm -hmm. that we pay taxes on. So I understand that there's a hierarchy and a, a progression to the steps that need to be taken but as an immediate response, when Friday night rolls around, should we expect that our best bet is to call 911? Should we expect that, should we take the, you know, the route of trying to knock on the door at 11 p.m.? No, like, let me begin what, by What are you suggesting? And I think I can speak for the police department that's standing I got, here. I got they somebody will tell for you. you do Madam, not Madam, sure. Madam, listen, we got right here, <laughs> see Sergeant Cowan. Okay. He's in the chief office. So come on, sit by him and give him all that information. Okay. And you'll see, a, you're going to have a Friday night party you never, they never had before. <laughs> so, and put, it okay. on, and put it on YouTube too so we can send a message to everybody. <laughs> we ain't going to tolerate that here. This ain't no Airbnb. <laughs> so Thank you. If you could do that, it'd be good. All right, turn it up to our school board member, Vicki Turner. Okay. District 5. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you for having this discussion tonight. And I couldn't leave out without saying how very proud I am of what you're doing in our community, Commissioner. For all of you that sit at this table, thank you for serving. And the truth is, everybody at this table, we don't pay them enough for what they do. And we Amen. know that. Amen. And thank God, though, we don't do it just for the money. We do it because of the passion. But I want to say something. Uh, Paula Tate, which... Uh, Commissioner Johnson acknowledged who likes to work behind the scenes. This woman with all this gray hair refuses to go away because this is her community. That's right. And she has called me, text me, email me and tell me anything going over in this school. So any we, we celebrate those children in that principal but I celebrate Paula Tate in the community here that says this is our community and we are not going to let it go just any kind of way. I want to say this and I'm going to sit down. I didn't, you know, I was a typical kid when I grew up. I didn't, I wasn't loving my mother and my father all the time. You know why? Because they were strict. Because they let me know you ain't running nothing. And they gave me chores and they gave me rules and expectations like this judge up here said. But I think I turned out okay. Mm -hmm. 
because my dad took my three brothers to the bus stop every summer and said, go find a job and don't come back here until you get one. My mother said, one call, that's all. Let them call me one time. I want to say to you, grandparents, parents, uncles, aunts, this is a community issue. That's right. My email has been over, overwhelmed with pictures of gun, a, a play gun went to school today by a kindergartner. Now, my thing is, the judge says, open the book bag. My, my parents let me know, you going to close the door in my house? Children that are left to their own devices, the word of God says, will put you to shame. And we are ashamed as a community because we are abdicating raising our children to the police department, to the school district, to the, the teachers are doing the best they can, but they're having to raise children because parents have abdicated the responsibility of saying no. You can't do that. You won't talk to me any kind of way. See, my parents said, you will say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am to me. Or a backhand went upside your mouth. I'm just saying, my parents weren't afraid of the law when it came to rape. I'm, I know I'm, I hope I'm singing to the choir, but I'm saying to you community, we got to rise up and take back our community. It's not just these people's uh, a responsibility. This is a community issue. And we've got to lift up a standard for our children. Open book bags. I got a picture of a knife today. A knife went to school today. We had a threat today. This man just didn't tell you. A threat went against Southwest DeKalb, Cedar Grove, Rainbow Elementary, Chapel Hill Elementary, and this is what it said. The school will be shot up by noon today. Mm. This is what came in our email. But thank God for Gober, who I keep wanting to call Goober. But they were Johnny on the job. And they, they are investigating. Our kids are in good hands. They are doing their job. But parents, you must do yours. You must do yours. You must say no. Let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Mean what you say and say what you mean to your children. All right. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. This will be, be our last speaker be before I close it out. Won't be long. But I have something. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Ronnie Johnson from the County Line, Ellenwood community. Real concerned about my community that I just want to bring something to light that I don't know why we can't do this. Gun. We're talking about gun. You ride by a pawn shop right now, if it's closed, you peep in the window, you see gun. It's like a candy store. Mr. Jack Lofton, please. Pawn shops in the Cab County, all over Atlanta, two minutes. If you peep in them, all these kids see is gun. Why can't, now this is what I don't understand. Why can't that pawn shop, your pawn shop, why can't you put those guns in a ball at night? Lock them down. You are you you making this candy store open range for these kids. Why can't we lock our guns up at night? I lock my eyes up, all but the one by my bed. <laughs> but uh, lock these guns up. Get these pawn shop to lock these guns up. All right, test, test. Okay, now th th this is this is a problem. This is a problem, and I'm going to listen to me. You have to, police respond to crime, okay? When you call the police, a crime has happened. One of the things you have to do is in any burglary, dealing with a juvenile, there are two things they want out of your house. I need y'all to pay attention to this. This is a good there information. There are only two things they want out of your house. The flat screen and the gun the flat screen and the gun. What we need you to do, and I told my neighbors this, if you see a kid during school hours walking in your neighborhood, call the police. 
I guarantee you, if you see a kid ringing on, like you said, Commissioner, we need, we need neighbors. I don't mind my nosy neighbors, because my nosy neighbors prevented a burglar. Right. Right. Called me on the phone and said, listen, somebody's, uh, some kids are on your deck. Should they be on your deck? I said, no, I don't have no kids, and they should not be on my deck. They kicked my door. She called the police. That's a nosy neighbor, and I don't have a problem with that. We need more nosy neighbors. But again, one of the things we did in our community is I told them, I don't care if it's profiling. If it's during school hours, they should not be walking down the streets in your neighborhood. Let me tell you the protocol. Any of these police officers will tell you this. The protocol is this. One of them go to the front door, ring the doorbell. The other two go to the back or the however many other there are part of it a part of this whole scheme. If you don't answer the door, no one answers the door, that one goes to the back, signal them, they kick in your door, and they go in and steal whatever. That's how it happens. And the burglaries with youth, youth normally happens during school hours. Because they're banking on, if their kids there, they're in school, but the after school hours, somebody's going to be home. So again, you have to do your part in saying enough is enough. Our community is our community, just like we did in that one cul-de-sac community. Enough is enough. And you have to be fed up with it enough to say wrong is wrong. And that when these kids are out, again, you see them during school hours walking in your neighborhood Call the police because they are truant. Okay? All right, thank you. I want to recognize uh, Judge Story is here. I want to recognize her from my traffic court. Let's give her a hand. Thank you, Judge Story. <laughs> Mr. Murray. Uh, I just have one question to the commissioner. Do we still have a gun interd interdiction unit in the Cal County? Yes. Is we it do. a viable one working? <laughs> well, you got to... I mean, in, in terms of working, res response, when we call up and say, um, we seem to see some questionable conduct by, like, drugs and stuff, do we get a quick response, or, or, or how, how does it well, work? You, you, one thing you got to know about gangs is that's... You got to get to the root. A lot of folks are going into gangs because they don't have family. A lot of them go into the gangs because they want to have some income coming in. So it's more to it just, they're doing their job, but it's a system that's feeding more people that goes to the gang. And we're not making excuses and public safety can talk, but our gang unit, talk to our DA. They're doing a, a, a bang up job in terms of getting as many as they can off the street. I got, we had one over here when the shooting happened where the person was murdered at Columbia High School over at Austin Oaks. The gang leader is 21 years old. And to a 13 year old, 21 year old, that's an old person. So we had the church go over there about 9 o'clock at night because they wanted to do a concert and make sure we could shut it down. They went and talked to the gang member. Guess what happened that night? No crime. So it has to be more, the gang unit is working, but we also need some folks in between to help mediate some of these things that can connect to them and say, okay, there's more to life than just being in the gang. Here's some job opportunities, some other things that has to happen. So folks like you with that experience, Mr. Murray, we got to get you off the couch. You can't leave us because we need you at MLK High School, Southwest High School, so the police can't do it by themselves. I have done my share already. <laughs> you can talk on social media. All you got to do is get on your phone. You don't have to talk to them directly. Just get on your phone. But you can talk to our public safety director after this on what they're doing because then you can have them come out to the Brooklyn, have them come out to the Brooklyn subdivision and the gang unit can come out there and tell you about what they're doing. All right? I want us to give it up for our panelists. Yeah. Public Safety Director Jack Lumpkin, our District Attorney Sherry Boston, our Solicitor General Donna Stribling Coleman, Judge Crawford, Pamela Stratterbrand, and Bradley Goober. These are our panelists. Thank you, thank you for Bob Mathis Elementary School.